Hello and welcome to Slide Review. Today we are going back to genitourinary to take a look at some more kidney lesions. Um, and as always, we start with our standard disclaimer. And uh, for anyone watching this or in our live chat, if you have any questions, comments, uh, feel free to add those. Um, we always have our Twitter handles below so you can get a hold of me in a variety of different ways. And this week we're really just finishing up with uh, some of the other lesions. We could honestly spend probably three, four hours just going over renal cell carcinomas, which we touched on last week. Um, but I felt that getting a little more variety um, and seeing a little more of the cases that are available on, uh, on Path Presenter uh, would be better use of everyone's time. Um, not to say that you can't learn a lot from looking at uh, many iterations of like your clear cell renal cell carcinomas and papillary renal cell carcinomas, uh, since obviously those can be very tricky. Um, but these are some of the more, um, not necessarily rarer things, um, but things that I definitely don't see as much um, on the genital urinary service and obviously congenital, you might see this more on the pediatric service. So with that, we'll get started with our congenital neoplasms. And this is case one. What we're seeing here is obviously a very busy lesion, lots of cellularity going on. We have some normal fibroadipose here. And uh, if we go in on higher power, What we start seeing is what's known as fascicular pattern, where it's um, like herringbone or streaming pattern of these very spindled cells. Uh, and if you go higher up, you can see that they're very bland. Uh, they have rather inconspicuous nucleoli. Um, and some of them appear to have some vacuolizations as well. Uh, And one of the other features to note with this is what we see here, if anyone knows what these structures are. Well, keeping in mind that we're in the kidney, these are glomeruli, okay? So we start seeing, here's our Bowman's capsule and you have your capillary loops and uh, here you have normal renal tubules, okay? So what this lesion likes to do is it likes to surround whole areas of normal renal structures. Um, and the reason why these maybe don't look as plump and uh, as well developed as we would expect to see in kidney is because these are congenital, right? So we're expecting to see this maybe in a baby or a toddler, okay? Um, but what you really don't see in this lesion, and it doesn't really matter where you go on the slide, is you're not gonna see mitotic activity, you're not gonna see pleomorphism or necrosis, um, and definitely shouldn't see areas of desmoplasia. Like even if we go back to the areas where we were surrounding the renal structures, we note that there's an absence of desmoplasia. It's, it's almost like, uh, the lesion is not really irritating to the tissue, if that makes sense to, to everyone, um, because desmoplasia to me just seems like a very violent reaction to something that's infiltrative. Um, and that's kind of the main things to note. The borders on this, um, so we could tell from low power that wasn't encapsulated, but what you can see here is that it's going right up to the perirenal fat. Um, and you, it's really hard to tell uh, really where the lesion ends and the normal tissue begins. Um, and that's just kind of the nature of it. There are variants of course with this that are more cellular where you'll see more mitotic activity. Um, but this was just a, a very nice example of what you'll usually see. And here we have another area with more glomeruli. 
So more glomeruli and more renal tubules. Uh, so what kind of lesion are we looking at here? So this is actually a mesoblastic necroma. Okay. And this is more of the, the classic type. Um, but these tumors can actually present in utero. So um, during third trimester, if mom's going for a growth scan, they might actually see this when they're uh, doing ultrasound and be aware of it prior to uh, labor. Uh, these account for 5% of all your pediatric renal tumors, and they're rare in children older, older than two years old. Our cellular, which would be like our obviously more cellular, more mitotic figures, uh, more instances of like uh, pleomorphism or necrosis. So 66% of these tumors will be cellular type. However, the presentation will occur closer to around five months of, of age. The classic type, which is what we had in our case, accounts for 24% of all these lesions. And the mean age of diagnosis is 16 days old. Okay, so note the difference there between months old and days old. And a mix just being variations of the two uh, accounts for 10% of the tumors, and they tend to present at about two months old. These generally are unilateral lesions, and they'll be anywhere from five centimeters for our classic type uh, to nine centimeters for our cellular type, which makes sense. It's very cellular, it's growing very quickly. Um, our classic type. As you can see somewhat in the picture, it is a little blurry, I admit, but best picture I could find up here um, is that it really looks like a leiomyoma that you'd expect to see maybe in the uterus or in your soft tissue lesions. Um, down here, it's showing more of like the cellular variant where you can get like cystic degeneration. It can be hemorrhagic in areas. Uh, and because of the cellular nature, you can also see necrosis again in these lesions. And obviously our mixed lesions are a mixture of both subtypes. For your microscopy, your classic again has these fascicles or whorls. You can see some vague whirling here of very bland myofibroblasts, okay, with uh, thin collagen uh, fibers. What this picture shows really well and what we see in, in our case is the entrapment of these normal uh, glomeruli, normal renal tubules. Um, and you may or may not have chondroid metaplasia or dysplasia, uh, which we didn't appreciate in, in our case. Um, again, they tend to have irregular infiltrative borders like we saw on the edge where we had our normal fibroadipose. And you shouldn't really see mitotic activity or necrosis or desmoplasia. When you're looking at your cellular type, the cells become more plump and you start seeing uh, nuclear atypia where the spindle cells, even though they're still in the sheets, um, they're not gonna be as monotonous as what we saw with the classic subtype. Okay, um, the nuclei themselves start to become more vesicular or open and we start appreciating more nucleoli, which again, we did not really appreciate nucleoli with the classic subtype. You tend to see frequent mitotic, act, act, frequent mitotic figures. Uh, and in this context, that means 25 to 30 per 10 high powered fields. Um, remember, uh, high mitotic activity does vary depending on what lesion you're looking at and what service you're looking at. Uh, again, necrosis can be present and these tend to have more of a pushing border rather than infiltrative. Um, and this is partly because they're growing so fast so they don't really have time to necessarily infiltrate. They're just gonna keep growing as fast as they can. As far as your immunohistochemistry, uh, smooth, smooth, smooth muscle actin or specific muscle actin uh, is a very good marker. Of course, Vimentin is going to be positive. Uh, your uh, Wilms tumor 1 or WT1, as well as your INI1, are hit or miss. So they don't necessarily hurt you, but they don't also help you if you really weren't sure that are you looking at a Wilms tumor or a mesoblastic nephroma, what do you do if that's positive? Um, and that's where your SMA would come in and save you. 
Keratin should be negative, Desmin negative, and CD34 negative as well. There isn't any molecular to know for your classic or mixed subtypes. But when you're looking at the cellular type, there's uh, a translocation between chromosome 12 and 15, and that goes into our ETV6 and TRAC3 fusion proteins. And remember, our, our ETV6 and TRACs, um, those are uh, molecular findings that you want to know for a variety of different lesions. Your differential, so if you're uh, looking at someone who is older, because obviously adult is in front here, um, your mess tumors uh, come to mind. You want to think of things like clear cell sarcomas, uh, our magnetic stromal tumors as well. Um, and given the appearance, Wilms tumor and rhabdoid tumor would also be good things to think about. They treat these by doing uh, nephrectomy with wide margins and Again, these are very large tumors. Like it might not sound very big when we say five centimeters or nine centimeters, but if this is in an infant, that's, that becomes a very, very large tumor. Um, and then they'll add in chemotherapy if they weren't able to completely excise the lesion or if there was rupture while they were taking it out. Um, and this has to be in patients that are older than three months old. So if we go back to our classic, in which case the, the average presentation was at 16 days old, these patients would be far too young to even consider doing chemotherapy in. However, the five-year survival is excellent at 96%. It doesn't really get much better than that. Um, and 5%, 5 to 10% of the cellular type will metastasize to the lung, brain, or bone. Poor prognostic factors uh, are things that we keep seeing again with other lesions in other areas of the body. So it makes sense that it would be the same thing here where our cellular type or really advanced staging, vascular involvement, those kinds of things would pretend a poor prognosis. But still when we're looking at the average prognosis at five years is 96% 96% survival, um, that still is, is pretty good. Uh, and again, here we have an entrapped glomeruli Moving on to case two. Uh, so this lesion at low power has some things in common with our previous. We can see that down here would be our normal renal parenchyma where you can make out some glomeruli as well as tubules even at this power. And we see this very cellular lesion. It's very blue, yes, exactly, extremely blue. Uh, and that's usually a good sign that Unless you're expecting this to be a lymph node, you should probably take a closer look. Uh, does anyone have any thoughts about all the pink that's in here in between the blue? No idea yet. Okay, that's fair. Uh, it's also fair to, oh, to ask me to move around or, or go to higher power. Um, but at this low power, things that I would be thinking about is, could this possibly be necrosis? Uh, could it be uh, blood? Like, are we looking maybe at fibrin or serum? Uh, could it be collagen deposition? So those are always things to think about when you have a lot of pink going on. Um, but I agree, we need to see closer. So if we go in closer and we'll look at the blue, what we start noticing is we have all these cords of cells and, and cords be, meaning that we have almost like these pairings with not much space in between them and they're just kind of going everywhere. Some of them almost look like uh, little knots or tubules, um, but it has a very distinct look to it. And definitely looks very different from what we saw in the previous case.
And then if we go into our very pink areas, so going back to this, we have all these collagen fibrils. Um, and that's something I get asked quite a bit, especially by uh, like junior residents is like, how do you tell the difference between fibrin versus collagen? Um, cause it, it can be really confusing cause they just say, well, it's fibrillary. Um, but what we see here is that you don't really have to guess that these are fibrils. Uh, some of them are very thick and they tend to be laid in, in patterns that you can imagine would be building up almost like cross hatching. Uh, and for the most part, that's what collagen likes to do, at least initially. So if you're ever not sure that you're looking at collagen, that's one way to find out. But okay, so we have collagen or hyaline deposition. And... Maybe you could argue that this is cystic. This is probably as good as we're getting for uh, cystic change in this. Um, one thing that I didn't really find in this though that you can sometimes see in, the, in these lesions is somoma bodies. So somoma bodies would be like really intensely purple or blue and oftentimes they have uh, a cracked edge. Um, but I did not appreciate any in here and considering they only occur in about a fifth of these cases, uh, I don't feel too bad about that. Um, so okay, so we've already seen our mesoblastic nephroma. So do you have any thoughts about what this one might be? I only know no Wilms tumor, so like. Okay, <laughs> well, you know what? That's one of the hardest ones, so that's fine. Um, this is actually a metanephric adenoma. Um, so this is probably more common than a Wilms tumor, but uh, yeah, Wilms tumor is a very good one to know because <laughs> that one is challenging. Um, so the good news is that this is benign. Sometimes they can metastasize. Um, but they really only count for 0.2% of our adult renal neoplasms, again, because those renal cell carcinomas just kind of take over that category. Uh, and they can occur at any age. We have like the Lego phenomenon going on here. Um, but average would be 41 years old. So whereas we have our Wilms tumor and mesoblastic nephroma, you think very young children, maybe even infants, this you'd expect more to see in middle-aged adults. Uh, and patients often don't even know that they have it, but they might complain, complain of abdominal pain, uh, or they might discover that there's hematuria. Uh, and if there's a, a very large lesion that's encroaching on the, uh, the renal parenchyma, um, they could also present with symptoms of hypertension, again, just going back to basic physiology and what uh, the kidney is responsible for. Uh, and very low uh, association with polycythemia, but if you had a patient who had known polycythemia and they present with a renal mass, it might not be a bad idea to think about this even before you see the, the lesion. Very similar to our mesoblastic nephroma, uh, these tend to be solitary and unilateral, very well circumscribed, and they may or may not be partially encapsulated. So remember when we say partially encapsulated, um, that'll just be some dense collagen uh, and fibrous tissue around the perimeter of the tumor. Like pretty much everything, they tend to be tan pink and they can range in size from just a few millimeters up to 20 centimeters, um, but the average of about five centimeters is um, what you'll typically see. And then as with pretty much everything else, you can sometimes see hemorrhage or necrosis, and you may grossly see calcifications. So even though we said that about 20% of cases will have somoma bodies, Somoma bodies you don't see grossly because they're very small. Um, so if you're seeing calcifications grossly, 
that would likely have associated somoma bodies, but you don't necessarily have that in reverse. Uh, and this pretty much looks like what our lesion did, where you just have these really tightly packed, very bland cells uh, that if they weren't arranged in the architecture that they were, you would think about things like, oh, is this um, blastemal phase of um, Wilms tumor? Am I looking at another small round blue cell tumor? Am I even looking at maybe like a neuroendocrine type tumor? And sometimes, well, not sometimes, but the nuclei will also have, uh, may have these grooves and when I think about somoma bodies and grooves, uh, we also see that in like papillary thyroid carcinoma. These two aren't related, but having similar features uh, together can sometimes be helpful when you're trying to memorize about 100,000 different things. Uh, again, we see this acinar formation. We did see a little bit of, of cystic as well as hyaline change in our case, but you don't have to see that and you shouldn't really see mitotic activity or nucleoli. So for your immunohistochemistry, there are a few stains that will help you. Uh, again, we have that WT1 is gonna be positive. So that makes it difficult, right? If we're thinking about Wilms tumor. Uh, Amaker will also be positive. And we saw Amaker last week when we were looking at our uh, renal cell carcinomas. PAX8, PAX2, this is just telling you that it's renal differentiation. So if you were concerned about, is this a metastatic tumor from another site, that would help you. Um, BRAF, yeah, oh, BRAF will be positive, but only if the mutation is present, um, which is a pretty good chance since it occurs in about 90% of cases. And this B600E is the most common mutation seen with BRAF anywhere, well, in almost any lesion that's gonna have a BRAF lesion. So the reason why this is important, the negative for gains of seven, 17, and loss of Y is because that's what we saw with our renal cell carcinomas. Differential, so papillary renal cell carcinoma, Wilms tumor, uh, lung carcinoma, because lung likes to go to the kidneys as well. And here's our papillary thyroid carcinoma, again, because of the nuclear features, the somoma bodies. So all things that you'd wanna think about. Um, for these tumors, they're just gonna do sur surgical excision. So partial or complete nephrectomy and prognosis with them is excellent. Moving on to case three. Over here, we have benign tissue. And over here, again, we have this, all this dark blue, right? Uh, so this is probably where we wanna spend our attention. So if we go down, what we start seeing is that there's some very distinct populations within this lesion. We have some very small blue cell areas. There's some areas that are a little more loose and pink and kind of streaming. And then we also have these areas that look very glandular. So when we have all three of these components, what do you think we have here? Yeah, that's a Wilms tumor. This is a Wilms tumor, yeah. So this case was really nice because it had very easy triphasic um, a lot of times you'll find that there might be like blastemal predominant or uh, stromal predominant where it becomes very difficult to try and find uh, other aspects of the lesion. There's a lot of other things that you can see with Wilms tumor, but that's the gist of what you want to see with this. Um, like you can see things like squamous metaplasia. So let's see if we have anything down here. Yeah, it doesn't really look like it. Um, they can have uh, smooth muscle in them. They can have cartilage in them. Uh, so a lot of the heterologous elements that we like to talk about in other lesions. This one just pretty much looks like happy triphasic Wilms tumor. 
So most common pediatric renal tumor, about 500 cases a year in the US, uh, and that relates to one to eight per 10,000 live births. Um, most of the patients are between two to four years old, but almost all of them are gonna occur before a patient is 10 years old. Um, and they present obviously as the solitary abdominal masses, uh, a low percentage of them will be bi bilateral, multicentric. And we associate these with things like Wagger or Dennis Drash and Beckwith Wiedemann. Um, so I have all the goodies on those for you guys. Um, they are very well circumscribed tumors and they tend to be tan gray um, when they're fixed. When they're uh, fresh, they tend to be very fleshy in appearance. Um, they love to be hemorrhagic or necrotic. Uh, they can also have cysts in them and as well as a lobular pattern. This one doesn't really seem to have um, most of that, maybe a little lobular over here. And this looks like maybe we have some cystic degenerative features going on there. And the microscopy, as we were talking about, uh, includes three things. So your blastema, which are these very primitive small blue cells, um, and they tend to just kind of mash into each other where it's very difficult to tell where one begins and the next one ends. Um, and you will see mitotic activity within this, so don't let that scare you. Um, then you have epithelium, which can either be very primitive rosettes, and the rosettes meaning that the epithelium is along the outside and skirting around all that tissue, or it can be very well-formed tubules. Um, if there are glomeruli, they'll be very ill-formed, which means they, they won't have necessarily like a, a really uh, arborizing appearance like we expect to see with mature glomeruli. Um, your nuclei are going to be very uh, elongated or ovoid. And I don't know if you can really appreciate it too much in here. Mm, I think it's better in our case. But the nuclei almost, instead of being... Um, really rounded, they tend to get these wedge-shaped or, or tra trapezoid-type shapes. Um, and again, you can see uh, mucinous or squamous differentiation in the background. Your stroma tends to be very fibroblast-like uh, and relatively loose. Um, the um, stromal cells themselves will be very bland as well. And you can also see any combination of all these heterologous elements, like we were talking about. Um, and a nice finding is if you have very prominent skeletal muscle, that's often associated with bilateral tumors. And this is in, specifically in very young children. I know when we're saying most of them are under 10 years old, that's not someone who's old, but um, in a two-year-old, maybe you'd uh, more likely to find that. Uh, again, so the importance is that if you don't have complete triphasic morphology, you want to document what's the, the most dominant component. And the, the caveat to that is that it must have at least a third of your tumor being viable, or at least two thirds of that viable tumor must be one specific type. So that's how that works. Um, and seeing anaplasia, just like seeing um, cellular lesions in other areas, anaplasia or pleomorphism is associated with poor response, poor outcome. And this is, um, whether it's focal or diffuse, must also be commented on in your report. So here we have pictures of the stroma, just so you can see that. Um, okay, so your IHC kind of depends on which component you're looking at. So all the most same with WT1, your stroma being weakest, and your blastema, really you're looking for uh, Desmond positive, CK7, CD57 negative, your epithelium obviously being keratin positive and CD57 positive, and your stroma, really it, it depends what it looks like. So if it's smooth muscle, you'd expect smooth muscle markers like SMA. If it's, um, more uh, fibroblastic than maybe like Desmond. 
your WT1, which is on chromosome 11 at P13, and WT2, which is chromosome 11, P15.5, uh, are your most important things to uh, keep in mind, most common things to keep in mind for Wilms tumor. Um, P53 mutations are associated with anaplasia. And then uh, for familial Wilms tumor, you'd want to think about your FWT1, FWT2, uh, as well as inactivating mutations. So that, that's a lot of uh, molecular to digest, but WT1, WT2, these are uh, the biggest things to know. Your differential obviously includes other small blue cell tumors. Uh, you need to think about things like uh, renal cell carcinomas, ex especially your papillary renal cell carcinoma, uh, neuroblastoma, which also kind of is a small blue round cell tumor, and your perilobar nephrogenic rest. They do a radical nephrectomy and these patients will get chemotherapy. This is not a question, they just will get it. The prognosis for Wilms tumor is excellent at greater than 90% and they rarely get secondary neoplasm. And we already talked about the poor prognostic factors, but there's a few more of them there. So getting into our cystic lesions. So case four, uh, we notice that this is definitely very different from what we've seen with our other cases. Obviously, it's somewhat falling apart maybe, and it's just full of all these cystic spaces. There's not really a whole heck of a lot that's um, distinguishable as renal parenchyma, maybe this little bit over here. And if we take a look at these cysts, We see that they're extremely flattened, and this will kind of be the theme with these lesions uh, for this whole section. Um, but they're flat. Some of them are hobnailing or uh, sort of rounded projections sticking into the lumen of the cysts. You can see cuboidal cells as well with these, um, but I think in this case, they're almost all flat or hobnailed. Um, the other thing that you notice is that the cell, or sorry, the, the cysts are not back to back. There's always a little bit of stroma in between them. Yes, perfect. You got there even before I did, but yeah, so we have, uh, this is a cystic nephroma. So, okay, probably don't need to spend too much time looking at the rest of this. Um, but really just wanted to point out that it's not back-to-back -back cysts. It, you do have some fibrous stroma in between uh, in the, the sept day. Uh, and the stroma itself is relatively posse-cellular. Um, there are some, there is uh, a different type of stroma that you can see with these, but this one looks a little more posse-cellular. Maybe here seeing yeah, no, that's not good for either. <laughs> I don't really want to play guess what I'm thinking with you guys right now. Because um, I don't think that's really fair since we're looking at kidney lesions. But yeah, so cystic nephromas, we tend to see them in really young children and middle aged to more senior adults. They occur in women more than men, and the older you get, the more predominant that's going to be. And these usually don't bother the patient, but if they're large, they might have an abdominal mass or have obstructive symptoms. Again, familial associations with pleuropulmonary blastoma, but familial association, this would be relatively rare. These are almost always solitary lesions, and they tend to be... Um, again, between that like two to 20 centimeter range, but most of them you're gonna see are gonna be around five to six centimeters. Um, there tends to be very sharp delineation from your normal parenchyma, as you can hopefully see here, to your lesion. And they, they do have a capsule, a true capsule, um, and they may have a nodular or bosselated, which means uh, nodular or lumpy bumpy type appearance to the surface of the kidney. When you cut into them, you, they'll have this multi-located cystic appearance. 
um, and the cysts will all be thin walled and filled with clear fluid. Uh, once in a while you can find some of them might have um, serosanguinous or bloody type material or it might even be purulent, um, but more often than not it's going to be clear serous fluid. Um, you can also have areas in them that are solid, but they should almost entirely be cystic. Um, and you shouldn't have necrosis. So here when I'm talking about adult CN, so this is adult cystic nephroma, PCN means pediatric cystic nephroma. Since obviously we have bimolar distribution, there's gonna be some differences between the two of them. And this is just a nice example showing the cuboidal epithelium that you can sometimes see with these. So again, what, are, what do they consist of? Well, cysts lined by flat, cuboidal, or hobnailed cells. Um, the fiber septa that you'll see with them may or may not have this ovarian like stroma uh, or postcellular. There's a couple areas in our case where maybe it looks a little ovarian like, but um, overall it's relatively postcellular. Um, they do have prominent vascular uh, areas and particularly you want to focus in areas that are more solid. Our case, at least the section that we have, it's almost entirely cystic. Um, so that makes it more difficult to evaluate for that. You can also see foamy macrophages sometimes. And again, uh, when we have cysts and cyst content, macrophages love to go into that and try to clear everything up. You can sometimes see calcifications as well. Um, but you shouldn't see anything that's making you think of, uh, is this a Wilms tumor? Um, is this some other sort of small round blue cell tumor? Um, and you shouldn't have full out nests of clear cells within the cyst septae, because you can imagine that would make it very difficult to differentiate uh, cystic nephroma from a clear cell renal cell carcinoma. Your stroma, very similar to your um, uh, congenital lesions, it can have smooth muscle, it could have skeletal muscle. You can sometimes see cartilage uh, or microscopic cysts. And, and microscopic cysts um, can honestly be really difficult to differentiate from your normal renal parenchyma. But what helps you is the fact that your renal parenchyma, again, is going to have a very defined delineation from this lesion because it is encapsulated. Uh, so you shouldn't have normal renal parenchyma within your cystic nephroma. It should just be your tumor. As far as your stains, keratin and uh, desmond are really your most helpful stains. If you're thinking that your stroma looks ovarian type, ER and PR can be really helpful because obviously those should be positive in your ovarian type stroma. Uh, yes, this is a great picture of ovarian type stroma. Um, so hopefully you can appreciate that we don't really have areas that look like this in our case. Um, your molecular, if you're looking at a pediatric case, they tend to have DICER1 mutations, uh, whereas adults do not. Your differential kind of depends a little bit as to whether you're looking at a pediatric tumor or your adult tumor, but pretty much you're looking at tumors that either have small round blue cells or are very cystic. And that's kind of how uh, this differential is made. Treatment, just like pretty much everything in GU as far as renal tumors go, they're either going to do a partial or radical nephrectomy depending on size, stage, uh, location of the tumor um, and prognosis for these is excellent uh, and in pediatric cases they rarely transform to renal sarcoma uh, so note that's more specific for pediatric cases. This is more what I think our stroma looked like where it was more sclerotic and more spindle type cells um, but at low power they kind of looked like maybe they had some ovarian type areas. This is case five. So again, we see that this is predominantly cystic, um, but it looks like it's involving normal renal parenchyma, which we did not see in the previous case. And if we go and look at the cystic areas, 
we see that it looks very similar even on uh, a high power view compared to what we saw previously where it's mostly flattened, low cuboidal, um, and not much else to say about it. There are some maybe papillary projections like here. Uh, maybe these are trying to be. Can I say that the stroma is bluer? Yes. I think that's totally fair to say that it's bluer. It could be in part because of their staining. Um, but yeah, it definitely looks like there's more cells. Um, the cells that are here, they look maybe more round than the spindled appearance that we saw in the previous. Um, and it just kind of has maybe sort of a looser or almost mixoid type change to it. Uh, what else can we see in this? There's like, looks like a lymphoid aggregate there. <laughs> uh, let's see if we can find, oh, here's some gloms. Um, so what you, hopefully you can see too is that these cysts also involve the glomeruli, okay? Um, this glomerulus over here is more normal, um, but these cystic areas are involving the glomeruli. They're involving the tubules, right? We have expansion of the tubules, uh, as well as just the, the renal stroma. So this is involving all levels of the renal tissue. Um, but these glomeruli are still going to be completely functional. Um, so we have a diffuse process that is cystic involving all levels of the kidney. Uh, and I will say for context, these kidneys probably encompass the bulk of the abdomen and likely also extended into the uh, pelvis, the true pelvis, um, and probably weighed in an amount of three kilograms each. So I know that's maybe not a lot to go off of. But these are autosomal dominant polycystic kidneys, or ADPKD. And they're relatively common, one to two per 1,000 live births. Uh, we don't have sex predilection. And they are the third most common cause of end-stage renal disease. Um, as far as symptoms, the patients obviously tend to have hypertension, uh, as well as uh, uro urolithiasis, UTIs, hematuria, abdominal pain. So you can imagine uh, we have this lesion that while we have functionality of the glomeruli and the nephrons, um, we're, we have this very large mass that's beginning to encompass everything. Um, there's a lot of different associations with these and obviously things that also like to create cysts including cysts in other organs. So oftentimes, like in the CT I have below, you have your kidneys, which are more towards the center of the lesion. And remember when you're looking at CT, it's like you're looking at the patient from their feet upwards. So uh, on the left side of the screen is the patient's right side and on the right side of the screen is the patient's left. And that very bright uh, cystic area that's towards the top left of the screen, that's actually the patient's liver. So not only do they have cysts in their kidneys, but they have cysts in their liver. And that, that is quite common. These are huge kidneys. I, I can't uh, really express that enough. Like the, these kidneys will be as large as like 
actually probably even bigger than your cutting board that you're using. Uh, and they will be full of all these cysts that are filled with usually clear fluid, but sometimes they, are, they bleed into the cysts. So that's when you'll get that red, brown, or serous sanguinous fluid. And on microscopy, you're pretty much going to see what we had, which was you have cysts at all levels, all stages of the renal parenchyma. And the cysts themselves are lined by the cuboidal, columnar, flattened epithelium. And you may or may not have those papillary projections. I think we had a couple areas with papillary projections and a couple areas that looked like pseudo papillary projections. So they could have even been uh, septations that were just kind of broken off. Again, your nephrons that are present are going to be functional. Uh, and seeing things like hemorrhage into your cysts or atrophy, fibrosis, these are things that take time. So they're not something that you would expect to see right away with someone um, who maybe they've been watching and um, they eventually developed uh, polycystic kidneys to the point where they're developing end stage renal disease or to the point where they need to look at other treatment options. Um, and something that's important to note too is a fifth of these cases, and remember how common ADPKD is, a fifth of these cases will have associated adenoma. So whether that's clear cell renal cell carcinoma or papillary renal cell carcinoma. There's no IHC that's gonna help you with these. And as far as molecular, you have your PKD one, two, and three um, that are involved with this. And PKD one is really the important one to note since that's almost all your cases. And that's found on chromosome 16, P13.3. Um, but 10% of your cases, so even though we say, oh, 85 to 90%, 10% are PKD2, uh, approximately 10% of your cases won't have any family history. So there will be an unmapped mutation that we aren't sure what it is. So uh, something maybe a little more spontaneous or maybe you're looking at the prodromal case. Uh, sometimes you can see columnar epithelium like we were talking about. Uh, so the bottom picture is just a really nice example of that since a lot of these other lesions are gonna be flattened or cuboidal. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, note this, these lesions should not have hobnailing. So um, we saw that in our cystic nephroma. So if you're seeing that uh, with something that you're suspecting is AD, AD PKD, uh, maybe take a closer look. Your differential basically includes everything else that has cysts, okay, including polycystic liver disease because just like ADPKD can involve the liver, polycystic liver disease can involve the kidney. If you have a strong molecular background, that will push you in one way or the other. That will help you uh, treat these by um, nephrectomy. And for that, most often they'll do uh, bilateral radical nephrectomies as well as renal transplant. They can try using medical management to delay having to do uh, bilateral nephrectomies um, and transplant in these patients as well. Poor risk factors uh, for the most part include things that are gonna uh, assault the kidney even more. So your sickle cell trait, um, early onset disease, obviously, because it gives them more time to have problems. Um, hypertension, proteinuria, so just things that really are going to um, irritate or damage the kidney. Further, those are related to poor prognosis. Case number six. PD, yeah. Um, and then lots of cysts in there. Yes. So let's, the cysts look simple. They're not really forming any papillary formations. Mm -hmm. um, seems to be pretty thin. So, I'm going to that. Just check the normal part of the kidney to make sure everything's okay. You have two tubules, four nervi, both of them good. Um, let's pull those out here. So, these cysts are lined by huh, a little denuded. Yeah. yeah. You might have an easier time going to smaller cystic areas. That is an excellent one to go to. Okay. Lined by these sort of 
it's kind of like endothelial cells. Like it's mm -hmm. kind of like really thin, single layer. Kind of these sort of almost like not quite hobnailing, but they are protruding into the system space. Yeah. Um, so with all these cysts, I'm assuming it's some sort of cystic disease. That's great, because uh, we're in a cystic cystic lesion yes, section. I see. Well, that makes sense. That's okay. You came in late, so you're in the know um, now. Yeah. All right. So, um, let's, I guess, I don't know. It sounds like a little like the previous case we looked at. Like I know, right? Information you can provide me. Um... Okay, so this patient uh, has end-stage renal disease. Ooh. Yes, I do. Yeah. Dialysis. Yes. For how long? Five years. Okay, that's a decent amount. So I'm assuming this is not something that the person's born with. It's not like a correct. Disease. Okay, yeah. so then it's acquired. It's acquired. Yes. Romo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, so I do have a couple annotations to show you on this. Um, just because I thought, you know, sometimes it's difficult to appreciate some of the, the areas that we're trying to show uh, and we just talk about them. But the first one we have here. Um, so to me, these are the pseudopapillary projections where they almost look like they should have a fibrovascular core, but they don't. Can you go on higher power? Yeah, yes. you can. Yeah. yeah. So see, like they, they look like they should be a true um, papillary projection, but they aren't. No, they okay. Not. So I thought that was a great example. And then I have one more. But -unk. So here, I just really wanted to show the flattened epithelium. There's a little bit of hobnailing, uh, specifically the one that's right uh, superior to the box. Uh, that's a really good hobnailed cell. Um, but there's a lot of areas that are missing epithelium. So again, if you weren't sure about finding the epithelium, now you have that to look at. Okay, so yeah, this occurs with patients who have been on hemodialysis or have chronic uremia. So again, most likely patients who are gonna go on uh, dialysis. Um, and it essentially increases with time on dialysis. And remember, dialysis itself is not designed to be a permanent solution. Um, so these are very sick patients by the time they get to 10 years of hemodialysis. Um, however, we do see a slight sex predilection where we see it more often in males in the first 10 years, um, but, and it can occur at any age. So whether you're on hemodialysis as a child or as a, an elderly adult, um, that doesn't change you acquiring cystic kidney disease. So these are also very enlarged kidneys that will look somewhat similar to our adult osomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. However, they are much smaller. So where we were looking at up to 8,000 grams, eight kilograms for an AKPKD, these will be less than 800 grams. So a very uh, large difference in size. So even though these are big kidneys, they're still nowhere near that big. Again, these will be cystic, they'll have clear serous fluid, and they tend to replace the kidney parenchyma with cysts. So all that sounds very similar to our AKPKD. Uh, the microscopy is also very similar. We do note that instead of having uh, columnar epithelium and no hobnailing, we see the cuboidal epithelium and hobnailing like we've seen in our previous cystic lesions. Uh, the pseudopapillae with nuclear enlargement or loss of polarity, um, those may or may not be present, but if they are present, that does help you figure out if you don't have patient history that maybe you're looking at acquired cystic kidney disease. You may or may not have oxalate crystals, uh, present in your tissue as well. And in your renal parenchyma, again, you, you need to consider that these patients have end-stage renal disease or they are very rapidly going there. Um, so you're gonna see global sclomerulosis, uh, interstitial fibrosis, tubular atrophy. So basically what you're seeing is 
scarring of the kidney tissue and it's shutting down. Okay, and that's also different from our AKPKD because those were functional nephrons. So even though they're cystic, even though it looks really bad, they're still functioning fine. There's no IHC that's going to help you. And that's kind of also a common theme with these lesions, right? And as far as your molecular, what you can see is uh, gains in 7, 12, 17, 20, and Y. Um, and these are often seen in your atypical epithelial proliferations. So there's a question of, does this represent early neoplasms? Maybe that's a hint. Um, and we also note that the molecular is somewhat similar to what we're seeing maybe with our uh, papillary renal cell carcinoma, right? 717Y, those should always pop out at you for that. Uh, and your differential really, though, is, is this osomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, okay? And the other thing to add in there is if you have atypia, is this ACD-acquired or ACD-associated renal cell carcinoma? Because, of course, that entity exists, right? It wouldn't be pathology if we didn't have an entity that sounds and looks very similar to something else that, uh, of course, exists. Treatment is uh, nephrectomy if, if there's other indications. So um, what that means is pretty much if they don't have to go in and take this out because of obstruction or uh, it's causing the patient a lot of pain, they'll leave it, okay? Um, because by itself, these aren't necessarily problematic and the patient is going to go on hemodialysis to help correct that. And uh, if they're on hemodialysis, they're probably also working them up to see if they're a candidate for transplant. Okay, so for prognosis, obviously these patients are at increased risk of renal cell carcinoma, anywhere from 7 to 50 times increased risk. And however, uh, the overall incidence is about 7% at 10 years. So it's really not too terrible, but that is a really high risk uh, increase compared to the normal population. And death from acquired cystic kidney disease is rare. Um, if a patient has this and dies, it's far more likely that they died to complications related to their end-stage renal disease than the acquired cystic kidney disease. This next case, what we have is something a little different. Um, so this is an instance of, I disagreed with the whole slide image, so I just found some images that you guys can describe what you see in the image. I know, something completely different. This is K7. <laughs> sort of like this capillary sort of growth sort of inside the cyst. Sure. Yeah, and um, there's a lot of clear spaces. Mm -hmm. so there's a nice fibro. Vascular core. Um, and then these cells, I mean, it doesn't look normal. Okay, good. But this is at low power, so we're not really seeing the cytology of it. But it's, this architecture is a little too complicated to look kind of like crib forming, mm -hmm. I would say. Yeah. Okay. And um, yeah, it just doesn't look nice. Okay. <laughs> do, we have, do we have any higher magnification or? We have more pictures. Okay. <laughs> okay, so that's 22 year olds. Yeah. Okay, is there, is there something else that they could be? Because we have, we have tubules, but what are the arrows maybe pointing to? Remember, we're in a cystic lesion. Yes, yes, perfect. <laughs> So I think that's kind of what I'm pointing to for. Um, and then what I did was to not be too mean, I put what they actually are showing on uh, the picture so you guys can see that. So the first one pretty much is just, it's the mass is growing within a cyst. So you can see like the cyst lining towards the right side of that first picture. Uh, and then the second picture is just showing you those inter and intracellular lumina. Um, so some of them are within the cells and some of them are outside the cells. And, uh, and that's what that's trying to show you. Um, it looks like the, the white arrows are the inter 
intracellular and the black arrows are the inter, maybe. That's what it looks like more. So it almost gives them like this goblet cell type appearance, I think. Again, the tubular architecture, so you pick that out perfectly along with the microcysts. Uh, and then sometimes you can see papillary architecture. So just showing you the two different variants. Okay, so this is your acquired cystic disease associated renal cell carcinoma. <laughs> Um, and again, this was just because I, I disagreed with the one that was available. So I thought it was a good entity to have and wanted you to have some slides on that. Um, so this is the most common renal cell carcinoma in patients with a ACD. And it occurs in about a third of patients with long-term hemodialysis. So remember that as we saw patients on hemodialysis for extended periods of time, uh, we also saw an increase of ACD, and as we have increase of hemodialysis and increased risk of ACD, we have increased risk of the renal cell carcinoma associated with that. Um, so, but pretty much, uh, yeah, it, it's still relatively rare, but it is the most common type. So even though you can see clear cell renal cell carcinoma, you can see papillary renal cell carcinoma, the most common type is the ACD associated RCC, which is a mouthful. So you really want to get used to the acronyms for that. Uh, grossly, this will be a lesion in the background of ACD. Um, and they're usually relatively small lesions, okay? Remember when we were talking about our congenital lesions and the cystic masses, like they're, they're huge. They're five, six, 20 centimeters. These tend to be around an inch in size or smaller. Okay, but about half the time they'll be multifocal. Again, we have um, a process that is involving the entire kidney. So it's a process that could be uh, uh, eliciting uh, mutations in multiple areas. On microscopy, we have this very cribriform or microcystic they often refer to it as sieve-like or colander-like, um, which would be like a, like a vegetable strainer where you have all the holes in there to let the water out. Um, so that's really what they're describing with this. Uh, the cells themselves tend to have this granular eosinophilic cytoplasm, and they do have prominent nucleoli. Um, and occasionally, occasionally you can see clear cytoplasm, um, but it should not be like sheets of clear cytoplasm. Um, throughout the tumor. It should still predominantly be the uh, eosinophilic granular cytoplasm. Uh, you often find the calcium oxalate crystals. So in the bottom picture, the large bottom picture on the right, those arrowheads are pointing towards the calcium oxalate crystals. Uh, and those will polarize as well, but you can still see them on h &E. So it's important to recognize uh, what they look like on h &E so that you um, maybe as a reminder to polarize because it's not a bad practice actually to polarize when you're in renal parenchyma anyway. Um, these nodules, so these tumoral areas can arise within the cyst wall themselves or they can be completely separate from the cysts. So you wanna make sure that you're sampling your case well and you're looking at um, all aspects of the case. And these may be associated with hemorrhage as well. So. Um, that's kind of where the gross picture on top is showing you a more hemorrhagic cystic area. Um, so when you're uh, grossing these cystic kidneys and you see areas that are more red brown, more solid, those are always areas that you want to sample, even if it's just punctate or uh, very small. Uh, trust me on that. <laughs> Positive stains, so we bring back amaker again, as well as our pankeratins. And you can see that carbonic anhydrase 9 in your clear cells, okay? So you can hopefully appreciate where this is maybe complicating your differential a little bit. EMA and CK7 should be negative. As far as molecular, you start seeing gains of 3, 7, 16, 17, and Y. However, you should never see trisomies or polysomies of chromosome 7 or 17 in this. 
Um, so again, that helps you differentiate from papillary renal cell carcinoma. Um, and obviously clear cell renal cell carcinoma and papillary renal cell carcinoma are the major things that you're trying to differentiate from ACD associated RCC. For treatment, again, they're going to do a radical nephrectomy. Um, now, this is somewhat um, counterintuitive because we just said for ACD, they tend to try not to do a nephrectomy. So this is most likely you have a patient who's having obstructive symptoms or abdominal pain, they take the kidney out and you find this, okay? Um, now granted, if they were looking at uh, setting the patient up for transplant and stuff, they might've done molecular testing and found those molecular findings. Um, but the most likely case is for some other reason, they took the kidney out and then you find these lesions. These are uh, mostly believed to be indolent. Um, oh, there's a typo. But tumors with sarcomatoid, rhabdoid, or even typical features can metastasize. So this isn't something that you want to take lightly, um, but it's still a relatively uncommon finding. So that's your ACD associated RCC. And thus takes us to the end of the cystic lesions. From here, we're going to go into stromal lesions. So we've talked a lot about epithelium, uh, including our congenital lesions, which combined epithelial and stromal, to our cystic lesions, which were almost entirely epithelial. Now we're looking at purely stromal lesions. So this is case eight. Well, at low power, it's very, I mean, I think there's still a bit of kidney, so I'm assuming this is still kidney. Yes, but, um, it could I be think so. At other places, but basically there's a lot of fat, a lot of clear spaces, a lot of red, so bloody areas. Potentially, yes. Potentially, and or it could be some other stuff, but we just see higher power. Higher power, yes. So, okay, let's check the fat. Let's do this bit by bit. Okay, fat. Um, <laughs> looks pretty straightforward. You know, the nuclei are squished somewhere to the side, I think there, so it's not really like, you know, doesn't have that sort of sarcomatoid look to it because they usually start to get a little more glassy, like it's more of a glassy thing and they're mm -hmm. like a little bigger. These are still nice and flat and off to the side, so we're still good there. Um, this area, I don't think we see normal kidney plate. Let's take a look if we see normal kidney plate. Yeah, keep going. Yep, yeah, there you there go. Okay, there is normal but inside this thing, there's this like proliferation of something. Something. Where is my message? Let's check. Angiomyolipoma. He goes like straight for the throat. Like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just made my job easy. <laughs> so it is that. So let's try to find the different components, shall we? Yeah. Um, that does look like vessels. There's blood in there. Yeah, and what you're also looking for are all those small capillaries yeah. too. Um, yeah. Yeah, but what, since you mentioned the the big vessels, mm -hmm. uh, since that that is a feature, so what are we looking for with the big vessels? Can they just be regular big vessels in the fat? No. no. Okay. That because you asked. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Something to do with the last big thing. Okay, well, what do you think about the cells that are there? Does this look like a normal, happy? Not really. It's, it looks kind of funny, right? Yeah. Like, it, it doesn't look like full out, like, dysplastic, but it looks weird. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So we have vessels, so that's the angio part, like a lipoma part. So yes. And they are dysmorphic. Yes. So that, that's the word we're going for, dysmorphic. And there's a lot of them. I promise you there is because I did. I, I, I know, <laughs> I know there is. I did have to hunt for it. Yeah, there's a little bit of it, maybe. Because it's smooth muscle, yeah. remember? So um, it's kind of like, is it smooth muscle or is it like? Uh, mm, 
Did I annotate? That's a good question. Did I? No. <laughs> Sorry. Well, you know, we have a saying in pathology, if you don't dot or annotate it, you didn't see it. Yeah, I think I found it by going more low power, at, you know, yeah. mid-low power. Um, but it definitely was hard to find yeah. that. I think it's it's probably just all mixed in with yeah. everything. But, okay, like, this is definitely not an angiolipoma because angiolipoma doesn't have those thick dysmorphic vessels. Yeah. All right. All right. So, okay, yeah, it's an AML. Yeah. <laughs> not to be confused but with acute myeloid leukemia. Yeah. So we shouldn't be calling it AML. But in GU, we do. So, but AML. But like two crimes. You know, we talk, <laughs> call out the other specialties for using acronyms, and now we're doing two of the same acronyms. The same we do two, but unlike unlike a lot of other notes that I read every day, I say it and then I put the acronym. What? Um, okay. <laughs> or at least I do with most things. Okay, so these are less than 1% of all renal tumors. That's not surprising. Why? Because our RCC encompasses pretty much everything. Um, you can have extra renal sites, not just the kidneys, so liver, lungs, retroperitoneums, so generally still areas that aren't too far away from uh, the kidney itself. These are, if you're looking at familial associations, tuber sclerosis is the one really to know. 80% um, of patients with tuber sclerosis or TS will develop AMLs, uh, and that is related to loss of heterozygosity of the TSC2 gene. Um, there's also like the TSC2 PKD1 continuous, contiguous gene syndrome, um, but tubular sclerosis will be the one really to know. Uh, angiomyolipoma is considered to be one of the perivascular epithelioid cell tumors. So you can see it in the list there. Um, there's also a whole bunch of other uh, tumors, including all of the pecomas themselves. Grossly, these are circumscribed non-encapsulated lesions that have a pushing border, okay? So they shouldn't look infiltrative even though they're non-encapsulated. Again, huge range in size from half a centimeter to 25 centimeters. Uh, and you can actually grossly appreciate the different components. So your vascular areas are more red or bloody. Um, your smooth muscle components will be more grayish white or fleshy, uh, and your fiber adipose looks like fiber adipose, right? So it's going to be really yellow and greasy. Um, you can, so capsular invasion, when it says capsular invasion, just in case this is confusing, that means uh, renal capsule, okay? So a quarter of cases will have renal capsular invasion. They can also invade either the regional lymph nodes or the renal vein. Okay, and you may or may not see uh, cysts in these lesions as well. They're almost always unilateral, unifocal, um, but you can see multiple or bilateral tumors, and when you do, you should think about tuberous sclerosis. Microscopy, so as we were talking about, there's three components that you're really looking for. Smooth muscle, dysmorphic thick-walled blood vessels, and yes, no elastic lamina, but they, they look funny, right? Like they, they're they not really well circumscribed, not well organized, uh, the concentric rings aren't there, and no elastic lamina. Uh, and your fat components should all be mature adipose. So if you're seeing lipoblasts and it's immature fat, you need to think of something else, okay? And again, this is greater than 90% of tumors. Uh, so are there variants that could look different? Of course there is. Um, the most common variant that you'll see is the epithelioid variant. So I have a little bit about that. Um, the case that I picked out for you guys is just a, a classic angiomyolipoma. Um, and the spindled cells don't really play super nice with it, but I promise you they're there. The smooth muscle component is there. And yes, maybe I should go back and annotate it if that will make it easier. Um, you can see lymphovascular invasion. Again, that's what LVI stands for, including large vessels. So what do we mean by large vessels? So large vessels are pretty much the vessels that you learn about in med school. So renal vein, uh, superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, okay, big vessels. Um, however, this does not influence the prognosis at all. So it can basically go wherever the heck it wants, uh, and that doesn't necessarily change what's going to happen with it. You can also see positive lymph nodes. Remember regional lymph nodes. Um, and this just is referred to as tumor multicentricity. Um, 
which sounds really fancy. Normally, we would just say metastatic disease, but uh, they just refer to it as tumor multicentricity. And there's no reports of a patient dying from disease when they had this associated uh, positive lymph nodes. A bunch of other variants that we're not really going to get into, um, but AML's relatively uh, easy to pick out. For your stains, the big thing to note with angiomyolipomas is the top line. Those melanoma markers should be positive in all components. So you're not going to look at this and be like, I think this is a melanoma, but if you throw melanoma stains on it, it's going to be diffuse to positive. So that's your HMB45, melan A. I have S100 down in there somewhere. Um, and obviously, uh, your uh, uh, muscle-specific actin or smooth muscle actin, uh, that'll be positive in, in your myoepithelia, or sorry, your um, smooth muscle component as well as your lipomatous component. Um, there's a lot of other stains that you can look at as well, um, but really the, the melanoma markers and your muscle markers are the best stains to help you out with this. Keratin should be negative in this. Um, so again, helping pull you away from, um, uh, am I looking at more sarcomatoid type tumors? Am I looking at a, another type of carcinoma? Um, CD34, if positive, I think would only be positive in the vascular markers. I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, but the reason I say that is just if you were thinking, am I looking at an, uh, an angiolipoma? Uh, angiolipomas should have diffuse CD34 positivity. So that's probably how that one works. But uh, if someone knows more about that, it'd be great to hear about that. Uh, as far as molecular, they tend to have mutations uh, involving 5Q. Um, for tubular sclerosis, it tends to be the uh, TSC1 gene, which is chromosome 9, Q34, uh, encoding ham <laughs> Hamerton, uh, and the TSC2 gene on 16P13.3, which encodes tuberin. Uh, and remember, we referred to TSC2 gene previously with tuberous sclerosis as well. Your differential pretty much includes anything that involves uh, smooth muscle, fat, uh, of course we have liposarcoma in there, uh, rhabdomyosarcoma, if you were thinking things look a little more um, uh, plasmacytoid, um, also renal cell carcinoma with sarcomatoid differentiation, and melanoma in there and why um, well, it's going to be diffusely positive with melanoma markers, um, but even though melanoma can look like anything, melanoma should still look like one specific thing. It shouldn't look like three specific things, okay? Um, so AMLs, they can either observe them, or they can embolize lesion, or they can take it out surgically. Overall, these have a benign course, but obviously if they have more aggressive, more sarcomatoid type features, they'll be a little more aggressive. Um, but they don't really tend to get distant metastases, even if they have aggressive features. Um, however, you need to be aware that if the patient has bilateral disease, they could eventually develop renal failure. So then we go into uh, end-stage renal disease or hemodialysis, and you see how all these things start to interact with the, the ACD and the ACD-associated RCC, etc. cetera. Um, and the most important thing to note, too, is the uh, retroperitoneal hemorrhage. Um, remember, these love to invade those big vessels. Um, so if you have a tumor that's eating away at your inferior vena cava, you could have a patient that uh, extravasates, okay? Uh, and that could actually be the cause of death is angiomyolipoma invading uh, major blood vessel resulting in exsanguination. I said extravasation earlier. I meant exsanguination. So <laughs> uh, and that can be your cause of death. So. Uh, relatively benign, but they can cause a lot of destruction wherever they go. Case nine. 
something strange, something very pale here. Yes. This is probably normal kidney. Correct. Higher power. Higher power. Not so nice. Not very so nice. nice. <laughs> very luxuriant genitals. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I can find the form for this. It's very tired. It has sort of like a like comatous look to it. Wait, wait, go go back down a little bit. Yeah, there is. There's some right there. No, 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 no. You had like a perfect cell over here. Really big. Yeah, it's funny. Is that a normal fat cell? I don't even know if that's supposed to be fat, but I'll take your word for it. Yes, it's a very ugly fat cell. <laughs> very it's ugly fat very cell. Very big. <laughs> I mean, let's just if this is all fat, this has like way too much like sort of this pinkish stromally thing mm -hmm. going on. So when you see that, you're like, okay, I don't think we're dealing with a normal like coma here. And given this large cell, and these cells that just don't look very squished, yeah, it's probably normal. So, like, we'll start a coma. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. What type of liposarcoma? Mm, well, I had a de-differentiated case the other day. Mm -hmm. It didn't look like that, so I know that's not it. So, but does this look like normal fat? <laughs> it doesn't really look, I mean, it does kind of look like fat, but it's like weird fat. So. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, if you keep going around, I'm, I'm not going to torture you too much um, because, yes, I agree that this is most likely a well differentiated liposarcoma, but the, the importance is recognizing well differentiated versus uh, de differentiated. There is no moderately <laughs> differentiated. Okay. Um, now, you could argue either way because really well differentiated should look like normal fat with these lipoblasts. But I think what's happening here and what's difficult to tell is a lot of the atypical cells aren't necessarily in the pink stuff so much and it's kind of falling apart a little bit. Um, and the atypical cells that are there definitely look like they're associated with a fat globule. I don't feel like overall this has the look, like you were saying, of a de-differentiated liposarcoma. Again, if somebody wants to argue this with me, they're welcome to. Um, but I think for the most part where we're seeing stuff, it's in the actual lipomatous areas. Okay, so liposarcomas, and this is just general information because they're really not too common to find in the kidneys. Uh, they are the most common adipocytic malignancy and uh, well differentiated in particular account for almost half of your liposarcomas. So it occurs in middle-aged to older adults. If you see it in a child, a liposarcoma in a child, you want to think about is this kid maybe suffering from Lee-Fromini syndrome. Uh, grossly, if you're looking at a renal liposarcoma, they're often extra renal, which means that they surround the kidney, not necessarily within the kidney itself. And they tend to be multilobulated, but still well circumscribed. Um, they have this very yellow, yellow white, yellow tan, marbled cut appearance. They'll be very firm in most areas and, and where it's firm, that's less adipocytic differentiation in those areas. You may or may not see fat necrosis and one of the differentials would be fat necrosis, um, but it often occurs at the periphery of these lesions, not throughout it. Um, your de-differentiated areas uh, tend to be more firm. They're often described as most sarcomatous tumors as flesh-like, um, but they can also be admixed with the tumor. So what does that mean? That means you have to sample extensively, sample different areas so that you can see different aspects of the tumor. On microscopy, so it lacks the dysmorphic vessels and smooth muscle components that we see in AML. And there are three subtypes, but they really don't mean anything clinically. So it's more for our education and our curiosity to subtype them further. So lipoma-like subtype is your most common. It's 
going grossly look like a lipoma, hence the name, and you'll have very scattered atypical cells with lipoblasts. Your sclerosing subtype, which is most likely what our case is, uh, you have retroperitoneal or paratesticular locations, and you have this collagenous fibrous tissue with adipocytes and atypical uh, multinucleated stromal cells with a scant lipogenic component. Um, so the lipogenic component in these cases can also be missed entirely. So again, I wanna just recapitulate that the subtypes don't matter clinically, but our case in particular, I think is a sclerosing subtype. And there's also an inflammatory subtype, which is extremely rare, so I didn't even go into the details of that, but it is in your handout. So you can take a look at all the details on that in your handout. And again, just so that you're looking at lipoblasts versus uh, mature adipocytes, uh, your lipoblasts will have these very large uh, ovoid nuclei. Uh, you'll have fat vacuoles around them and they can even indent the nucleus. Whereas your mature uh, lipocytes or adipocytes should have a very small, slender, compressed nucleus that's along the periphery of the cell. Your stains, MDM2 and CDK4, are your most important stains. Um, and that's just because um, your MDM2, CDK4 is also your molecular findings for liposarcoma. And you can find those by either using FISH or uh, real-time PCR. These cases tend to have uh, ring chromosomes of 12Q13 to 1,5. And you can also see amplifications of 12Q1221. Your differential is pretty much anything that would include sarcomas, a, uh, lipomatous type AMLs, Hodgkin lymphoma, if you're thinking about is this um, either sclerosing subtype or your inflammatory subtype. Um, and treatment for these is complete surgical excision. If they have really good negative margins, then this is generally curative if they're able to surgically excise it. However, dedifferentiated tumors tend to metastasize. They tend to go uh, any which way but south, as the saying goes. Um, and the risk of dedifferentiation is directly related to your location of the tumor, so the initial location of the tumor, as well as the duration of growth. So the longer these are allowed to grow, the more likely you're going to have uh, metastasis of a dedifferentiated tumor, which I feel like is mostly intuitive, um, but I think knowing that location of the dedifferentiated tumor also plays into that is important. And this is case 10. This is our last case of the day. Okay, first thought, WTF. <laughs> it's blue. It's blue. It's blue. It's bad because we're not in the lymph node. <laughs> That's funny because I did actually describe that earlier at where I was like, blue, if you're not sure that you're looking for a lymph node. Oh. <laughs> well, this is not a lymph node. If not a lymph, lymph node. node. It's pretty bad. Okay. Well, I think this is pretty much all some sort of lesion tumor, most likely. So let's just go through random spot and hire. Ooh, look at that. Okay. It's kind so of pretty. It's, yeah. I mean, it's kind of, it, I mean, there's kind of this screaming pattern to it. Mm -hmm. But each cell is mostly like spindle, spindly in yep. shape. Um, so, you know, it's not carcinomatoid. It's probably a sar sarcoma, probably. Sarcoma um, yeah, spindle sarc lesions, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah it, I mean, other than that, the cells are. They look kind of off. They don't look very bland. Maybe it's just the way it's projected. There seems to be different sizes, but there are probably other cells mixed in there. Um, yeah. um, hmm. I don't know the name of this lesion. Okay. So you're pretty sure that it's a sarcoma? Pretty sure. Pretty sure. Okay. Yes. And it's very blue. Do we see, like, how many cell populations are you seeing? Hopefully just one, I would say. There might be some, I mean, what am I going to? Mostly I think it's just the spindly 
right laboratory cells okay but the actual tumor cells it looks like you just have one right yes. okay um so can you think of some things that maybe would look somewhat like this like whether or not they occur in the kidney or maybe no okay that's okay i like to call a friend <laughs> which is uh, me, <laughs> since I think we're, we're alone on the line at this point in the evening. Um, so this, this monotonous appearance with these short intersecting fascicles, this is something that you can see pretty much anywhere in the body, but usually has a biphasic appearance. The monophasic is seen more commonly in the kidney. This is a synovial sarcoma of kidney. Yeah. So are these vessels? Yeah, so um, one of the things that you can also see with this is that sometimes it can have like that, those staghorn type vessels, that hemangiopericytoma type vessels. Hemangiopericytoma also a solitary pyrus tumor. Yeah. Cool. Probably these ones don't look like horn like. Yeah. yeah. So you can see it, you don't have to. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so SFT and stuff like that, things that would be in your differential. But yeah, so this is synovial sarcoma. Uh, and again, synovial sarcoma, usually we see that in extremities, so arms and legs of young adults. Less than 100 cases. I think it's actually less than 80 cases reported in the kidney ever. And they used to actually just call this embryonosarcoma of kidney, and you can imagine why. The cells look very immature, even though they're slightly spindled. Uh, grossly, they're large necrotic and soft rubbery masses. So again, that fits with our sarcomatoid appearance. And you'll see smooth walled cysts in about three quarters of cases. These are larger tumors. So even though we've seen a lot of tumors tonight that have a wide range of size, these average 11 centimeters in size. So that, that's much larger than most of the other tumors that we've seen at five to six centimeters are uh, congenital lesions approaching nine, 10 centimeters. Those were uh, a, a little more um, in the ballpark of synovial sarcoma. On microscopy, again, you're gonna see these intersecting fascicles of these monophasic spindled cells. You won't really be able to tell individual cells from each other except for the nuclei um, because the cell borders really are not apparent. Um, but the nuclei themselves, <coughs> excuse me, tend to be ovoid and nucleoli should be inconspicuous. Um, and you'll find these around dilated renal tubules. However, we couldn't really appreciate uh, any normal renal parenchyma in our case. Um, and it probably just has to do with the section that was uh, within the database. Um, you may or may not see hemangiotype, <laughs> hemangioparasitoma like vascular patterns or those staghorn vessels, which is what the lower picture is showing. Um, and you can also see cysts with hobnailed epithelium. So again, the cysts, the hobnail epithelium, it just keeps coming back tonight. Rare features would be things like rhabdoid appearance, uh, a biphasic synovial sarcoma, which is m far more common in other areas of the body, as well as poorly differentiated variants. Your IHC, TLE1, CD56, CD99, uh, and BCL2 are actually uh, probably your most uh, valuable stains. Uh, negative, this would be negative for keratins, negative for S100, negative for CD34, SMA, Desmond. So pretty much ruling out everything else that we've seen tonight with those negative stains. Molecular, so this uh, synovial sarcoma relates to an SYT SSX2 transcript. And this is uh, because of a translocation of X18 at P11.2 to Q11.2. And this again, uh, like we've seen with some other molecular tonight, it's almost every single case. So if it's almost every single case and you're pretty sure this is a synovial sarcoma, uh, it's, it's nice to have really targeted molecular to be like, we're just going to do this one. <laughs> Differential, so you want to think about things like Ewing sarcoma, PNET. Again, Ewing sarcoma far more likely to occur in extremities. Hemangioparicytoma, of course, because we have 
you may see hemangiopericytoma-like vessels, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor, metastatic sarcomas, uh, primary retroperitoneal sarcomas, sarcomatoid renal cell carcinoma, of course RCC is gonna come back, uh, and this is really uh, renal cell carcinoma with sarcomatoid-like features, as well as that solitary fibrous tumor. Your treatment, they're gonna do a radical nephrectomy when it's involving the kidney, and they may or may not add adjuvant chemotherapy. Prognosis in these cases is extremely poor. The average life expectancy from diagnosis is 33 months, and if the patient has metastasis, survival is only about six months. So this is something that you wanna catch right away uh, and be sure of your diagnosis because of the implications. And that's what we have for cases this week. So if you like this video, please give us a thumbs up. If you aren't subscribed to us already, please hit subscribe so that you're notified when we have new content out. We do have 12 cases from uh, our GU part two kidney lesions. Uh, and remember that some of these might just have a differential. Um, and we will be back next week with more GU where we we will be looking at bladder lesions, and we'll also get those challenge cases done up in a video as well. So thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again on slide review.